Um, okay, and can you see my slides in full screen? Yes. Okay, uh, great. Um, so, okay, so to start today, um, we're going to try to introduce you to really the basics of the Jetscape framework, um, really with an emphasis on the more technical side of things, um, essentially how to run the framework. Um, and so I'll start off first with um, kind of a, a lecture or talk uh, overviewing what are some of the basic ingredients that go into Jetscape um, and what is kind of the software infrastructure of the framework. How do you interact with it? What do you need to know in kind of a practical sense? Um, so after the lecture, we'll spend really most of today um, going through some set of hands-on exercises um, that's really meant to get you comfortable um, running Jetscape from a technical side so that later in the school, you'll be set up uh, to focus more on the physics. Um, so let's, uh, let's just get into it. Um, so as, as you mentioned, um, during the school, as much as possible, we want to ask questions during the Slack. This will be especially important when we get to the hands-on sessions um, because you, know, you might have specific code you have questions about or this or that. Um, for the lecture piece, of course, you can, you can either ask your question in Slack or raise your hand um, and, and the chairs or somebody will, will interrupt me and let me know there is a question. Okay. So Jetscape itself really comes in kind of two uh, separate pieces. Uh, so one piece is uh, an event generator framework. Um, and specifically, it's a framework for general purpose Monte Carlo event generators in heavy ion collisions. Um, so you'll hear a lot more about the physics of this, um, especially tomorrow and in the coming days. Um, you can see the, the code and documentation that we have for Jetscape at this GitHub link. I think it's likely many of you have seen this already. Um, and this event generator framework is going to be entirely what I focus on today. Um, but there is a second piece of Jetscape, which uh, you will again hear about uh, much more later in the school, which is a statistical toolkit. And so that is... Um, uh, a set of tools to, to extract um, kind of global fits of, uh, of the models in Jetscape to experimental data. So it does this uh, to extract model parameters using Bayesian techniques. Um, and this is, uh, there is some code available to do that in a separate repository uh, listed here. Um, now, kind of, if you remember anything from the lecture, um, I think this is kind of the most important overview slide here, um, that uh, Jetscape is a general purpose um, framework for event generation. Uh, so first of all, despite the name, it means that Jetscape is actually not just for jets. Um, we essentially need to simulate a whole uh, heavy ion event evolution in order to study jets. And that makes this, this framework very much useful for a variety of aspects of um, generating events in heavy ion collisions. That's why we call it general purpose here. Um, and there's two kind of key aspects of this um, that, that are quite central to um, what Jetscape is and what its purpose is supposed to be. The first is that the Jetscape framework is modular. So what that means is there is a core framework um, that decides how different physics modules can interact with each other. Um, but the modules themselves can be user contributed. Um, so there's kind of this, this partitioning into this modular structure, which, um, which makes you as a user um, coming along with so your own physics module able to plug in nicely and take advantage of all the other physics that has been implemented by uh, all of our friends in the field. Um, a second important thing, um, which I think is a rather key improvement uh, in heavy ion physics is that the physics modules themselves are all open source. So anytime, for example, you see a prediction or calculation of uh, uh, Jetscape event generators that are compared to experimental data, um, you can go in and look exactly what was done in the code there. Um, and moreover, you can use that then to check uh, the predictions, not just against one specific observable in one paper, but really against many different observables simultaneously. 
Um, so all of that together, um, packaging this into a unified framework um, really has important benefits when we want to compare um, specific models of physics. Um, so from one stage of a heavy ion collision event um, to different models of that same physics. Um, as, as you know, heavy ion collisions are uh, rather complicated. They have multiple stages of, of really distinct physics. Um, you know, there is an initial state, so hydrodynamic evolution, jet evolution and parton showering, hydronization, hadronic rescattering. So all of these stages that, um, that evolve next to each other and, and interact with each other. Um, and having a, having a modular framework like this really allows us to focus on whatever physics you specifically are interested in while keeping the rest of that event uh, simulation fixed. Okay, so so Jetscape uh, at its at its most important you know one line summary is that it's it's a, a modular framework um, to to simulate uh, heavy ion collisions in a general sense. Now, what that looks like uh, a little more practically um, is this following diagram here. Um, so these different blocks that I write down here are different uh, types of physics modules. Um, so we start off. Uh, with some initial state geometry of a collision. And there are kind of two um, in parallel streams of uh, uh, evolution that occur. Uh, so in the top uh, row here, there is a jet evolution. So from that initial state geometry, the uh, jet evolution begins with a hard scattering. And then um, that hard scattering showers in a medium modified parton shower. And one can use different uh, um, combinations of physics modules to simulate that in Jetscape. And finally, the jet will hadronize um, from partons into hadrons. Now, at the same time, uh, from the same initial state geometry is produced an initial soft density uh, for the bulk medium. And then that soft density will evolve um, with, for example, viscous hydrodynamics. And that's really defining uh, how the medium is, is uh, um, evolving as a, as a function of time. And so there is this interplay between the hydrodynamic medium and the medium modified parton shower. So as the medium is evolving, the parton shower needs to know when it has a parton, what's the temperature at that location, for example. And so there's this arrow here going from the hydrodynamics to the jet that the jet, um, parton shower module here is reading information from the medium evolution. And in Jetscape also, um, we can in principle send information the other way, meaning that the jet itself can deposit um, sources into the hydrodynamic evolution, which will then be evolved according to hydrodynamics. And so there can be a feedback here. Um, now, eventually then this, this um, quark gluon plasma medium will hadronize as well and uh, can also undergo a hadronic cascade. Um, so these are kind of the categories of uh, modules that we have. Now, what exactly is implemented in Jetscape uh, is shown here. Um, so for the initial state, we have uh, Trento and just recently IP Plasma. For the jet uh, hard scattering, we use Pythia 8 usually. There is also a parton gun you can take if you want to do kind of more simplified studies. Um, for the, the media modified parton shower, we have kind of a whole list of um, uh, physics models that are here, um, as well as a few um, different hadronization methods. Um, and then for the medium evolution itself, we have an initial free streaming phase that can be used, um, followed by a couple of different options for hydrodynamics, um, either music or CLVisc, or you can even just feed in your own uh, external files. Um, as well as some, some simpler um, media models that can be used. And then these will, these are, we have a sampler to, to hadronize um, this, this medium, as well as a hadronic cascade uh, using SMASH. Now, some of these you'll notice have stars next to them. Uh, this means they don't uh, ship immediately with Jetscape. So when you download Jetscape, you don't immediately download those packages, but there are scripts um, that, again, you should have seen some of this in the, the um, prep instructions. Um, there are scripts to download um, 
these different packages that you can kind of just run with one line and then they'll be ready for your use in Jetscape. Okay, so what um, what really is the current status of Jetscape in a practical sense? So we have released just recently Jetscape version 3.4. This is the most uh, recent version of Jetscape. Um, and if you go to the GitHub page, um, you will see uh, a variety of documentation, um, links to more details about the physics that is going in here, um, links to installation instructions and some instructions on how to actually run and configure Jetscape. Um, so all that's to say that the framework is, is available for, for a while now and ready for your use. Um, and there is, there is really kind of a wide variety of physics um, available as I outlined in the last slide, um, but additions are always ongoing. Um, and so with that in mind, it's, it's also really the ideal time to contribute additional physics modules. So we, we highly encourage if, if any of you are interested uh, to start getting involved with that. Um, I, I think that's, that's really um, a great thing for, for the community. Um, one other word I want to mention is, okay, so what does all this mean for physics comparisons? Comparisons of Jetscape models to experimental data. Um, and just to say here, we have kind of uh, the first physics results of more or less out of the box uh, um, Jetscape configurations, meaning not, not um, uh, highly tuned for the most part, but you've seen uh, perhaps at, at a variety of conferences in the last year or two, um, some direct comparisons of Jetscape models to experimental data. Um, and so that's uh, that's something we have been excited about and are continuing to see more and more of as time goes on. Um, I want to emphasize that since this is a, a framework, um, there really is responsibility on the user as well. So the framework does not guarantee that you will get out uh, something sensible. There is a whole bunch of physics that's available to you um, and a whole bunch of kind of guidance of how to use that um, but you have to remember that you will get out the physics that you put in. So, um, you know, you want to certainly understand more than just trying to press the button and really be sure that um, the physics that you're running with Jetscape, how you're connecting these modules, what list of modules you're running um, is, is something uh, that, that actually gets at the physics that you want. Um, there, there is... Um, as well, quite a lot of theoretical work inside, as I've mentioned, but also one should keep in mind, it's currently only slices of the theoretical landscape. Um, so we're trying as much as possible to increase, uh, get more and more code in there so one can compare different models side by side in a fair way. Um, and, and so we're really kind of at the start of uh, uh, an exciting phase, I think, of having very well controlled theory comparisons of different aspects. Um, of the heavy iron collision event um, between different uh, different models. Now, um, I, I won't really say uh, much more about the actual physics going into Jetscape uh, today, but I, I really want to focus mainly on the technical side of things, um, what you really need to know to use Jetscape. Um, so this, this stuff uh, kind of from here on out will be uh, quite important for um, the remainder of the school and the physics sessions. Um, so please uh, um, feel free to ask questions. We'll run through um, most all of this during the hands-on session, which will start in a bit. Um, so you can ask your technical questions there. Um, but so, so let's, uh, let's take a look at this. So what do, what do you need to do to run Jetscape? Um, there's really just three steps. Okay, so the first step is you need to install and you need to build Jetscape. Um, now, uh, you all, uh, in principle, should have done this already. Um, if, you have, uh, if you have had questions about this, um, now would also be a good time to write in the software install help because um, you will need this uh, immediately during the hands-on session. Um, so install and build Jetscape, we hope, uh, is fairly streamlined at this point. Um, then the second step is you need to create a configuration file. Um, this is done in an XML format. Um, which will again get quite some practice uh, tweaking later today. Um, but that configuration tells you um, what modules do you want to run? You need a list of what of the available modules do you actually want to run when you generate events. And in each of those modules, what parameters do you want to use? 
Um, so every mod every module will have some set of parameters that you that you want to configure, and you need to choose which ones you want to run. Um, once you have that in place, you have a configuration file. Um, you just need to execute uh, something called run Jetscape, and then you'll be off. You'll be off generating events. Um, so uh, just to give a few more details on each of these uh, stages here. Um, so the, the installation, now, I, I think all of you should have seen um, some instructions of how to install Jetscape um, during the, uh, the prep instructions that we asked you to do. Um, but uh, here I'll also talk a little bit more generally. Um, so there are a variety of ways that actually you can install Jetscape depending on your setup and what works best for you. Um, so you can install Jetscape using Docker. Um, so Docker, um, we, we had some significant documentation trying to introduce you to and the prep instructions. We'll uh, come back to this more uh, today. Um, this, is, this is a very easy way um, to, to install Jetscape. Um, and there's another option similar to Docker that you may be familiar with called Singularity. Um, and both Docker and Singularity are ways that kind of help you uh, take care of all the details of setting up the software prerequisites to install Jetscape. So very well-controlled environment, very um, uh, uh, easy way, we hope, to install Jetscape. Um, there are still, uh, it's of course possible still to install Jetscape manually, as we call, uh, meaning that you need to, um, on your own system, uh, set up all of the software prerequisites that, are, that Jetscape will rely on. Um, so we don't usually recommend that unless um, you really want to do that. There are instructions in some detail of how, what exactly is needed. Um, and one other note uh, is that there are a variety of external packages. So I mentioned that there are kind of these starred optional packages that don't natively ship with Jetscape, but that you can download. Um, so to use those, you need to download them and then also um, when you build Jetscape, you need to choose um, some different options to use with CMake. Um, so there are some examples here that if you downloaded music, for example, when you compile Jetscape, then you want to call the CMake command and turn music on here. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll again uh, go through this, have you do this uh, during the hands-on sessions. Now a word um, just to emphasize about Docker. Um, because Docker is, uh, is what we um, support and require at the school. Um, so with Docker, and the idea is that we really kind of one line of code to create an environment that contains all the software prerequisites that you need to run Jetscape. Um, so there is documentation linked here and also in these prep instructions where um, depending on what system you have, it works on Mac, it works on Linux, it works on Windows. Um, you can basically uh, download Docker itself and then run one single line of code, which will download this, um, uh, this software environment that we've set up. So this um, uh, so-called uh, containerized way of running code um, where on your laptop, you can more or less kind of partition the software environment that is independent of all the other software on your machine. And within that environment, uh, uh, run Jetscape. Um, so our idea here is that for the school, everyone really should be using this Docker approach. Um, we'll have kind of a limited amount we can support. Uh, the other type of installations will, of course, do our best, but, but we really ask um, uh, that, that uh, you have, I hope, used the Jetscape uh, Docker instructions to get set up there. Um, that will really simplify your life in terms of debugging um, and really focusing on the physics of Jetscape that we want. Okay. So after the installation phase, um, once you have Jetscape installed, you need to configure Jetscape. And so to do that, there's two different um, XML files that are actually used uh, in this configuration process, so-called master XML file and so-called user XML file. And so the, the uh, master XML file is one that you should never modify. This is kind of like a database of all the possible parameters and all the possible modules that Jetscape uh, contains. So it contains default values for every possible module and every possible parameter. Um, 
that's something that can be useful for your reference. So it's it's very helpful if you you want to know what are the options of how to configure this different modules, or even what are the different modules themselves. Um, you can look into this uh, master XML file, and you see all the possible things that you could um, configure uh, with Chatscape. Now, what you actually will use then when you want to set up your particular run of Jetscape is uh, what we call the user XML file. So this, uh, this is something that you will take full charge of. This will be something you provide. Um, we'll give you examples. We'll run through some examples of how you can do that today. Um, and, and it should, in principle, be uh, simply a list of which modules you want to run and which default parameters you want to override from the defaults. Um, so if you just listed uh, the you know, five modules that you want to run and you didn't list any specific parameters in your user file, it will just use the default parameters listed in the, in the, in the master file. It doesn't guarantee, again, they'll be correct or that the combination of everything will be correct. Um, and so you may uh, often want to um, select for yourself which specific parameters to override those defaults. Um, that's, that's something that we'll uh, encounter frequently. Now to, to um, show you in a bit more detail what this looks like. Um, so this master file, which again, you don't modify and serves kind of as your database of possible modules and parameters. Um, there's kind of a, a, a snapshot of it that I show at the right. So this is rather big file. Um, so this is just kind of the beginning of it. Um, there will be some kind of general settings in here. And you see this kind of uh, funny XML syntax that you may or may not have encountered before. Um, if you want to modify things, of course, just kind of copy this, this syntax that you see here, these, these tags. Um, you can set you know, number of events, uh, some if, you know, options or whether to reuse the uh, Hydro events, uh, some technical settings like debug settings and so on. Um, things like what output format do you want to write? Um, and then eventually, after kind of some of this initial information, you will start to see the modules themselves. So you'll see our ah, initial state module. And then there will be a whole bunch of parameters and different options that are there. And you will see similarly for, um, for the medium itself, for uh, the jet itself, and so on. Um, so really everything possible that you can configure with this XML interface, you can see uh, what its list is and what its default value of uh, any parameters are. Now, that might look a little bit complicated, um, but then when you want to run, uh, Jetscape yourself. Again, you just need this user file. And so this is um, this is much simpler. So I show an example here on the right. And here, you know, I haven't truncated the file at all. This is what your full user configuration file would look like. Um, so you start off overriding any, any um, parameters that you want. So we might set the number of events that we want to run. We might set the output format. So as I'll discuss, there are a few different options of what output format to write your events in. And then there's a list of our modules. So we said, OK, we want an initial state module, Trento. We want uh, a hard process that is, um, uh, that is going to um, start the, the jet part of the evolution. And then we want also a hydrodynamic evolution that we um, to, to simulate the bulk evolution of the medium. And then some uh, jet energy loss modules here. We decide to override a couple of parameters here um, within this matter uh, jet energy loss module. And finally, a hadronization module. Um, so there are a few different examples you can see in, in the Jetscape um, repository under the config directory. Um, and this is something, again, you want to adapt to exactly the physics that you want. Um, and you eventually want to think, OK, what parameters do I want to run this specific module with and that module with? Um, uh, just to emphasize, whatever modules that you list here will be the ones that will be activated. So if I list an initial state here, uh, Jetscape will add and run an initial state module. If you didn't want to run that module, you should just omit it from your user file. Um, and similarly, with um, if there are a bunch of different options for the, the exact physics module to run within, say, the jet energy loss, if I put in matter here and ADS-CFT, then those two will run. But the other 
three jet energy loss modules that are possible um, will not run. They will just sit in that master XML file, um, but they will not uh, actually be run unless they appear explicitly in your user XML file. Okay, so uh, now once we have Jetscape installed, we have Jetscape uh, configured, uh, we just need to start running our events. And to do that, there is one central executable called run Jetscape. And so when you compile Jetscape itself, um, it will compile this executable. And uh, any module then that you had listed in your user XML file will be automatically added uh, to your event generation. And you don't ever need to recompile this executable, for example. You just, if you want to update something, um, um, you just add your module to the, the user XML file. Um, caveat to this is if you're adding a completely new module, uh, you will need to recompile. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that uh, uh, later as well. And so once you have that, you just run the command like the one here. You just call run Jetscape and you pass as a command line argument the path to your um, user XML file. And then you should be off and happily, I hope, generating events. Now, there are, um, I mentioned a few different options of the output that you will get out of those events. So when, once they finish uh, 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 simulating, um, then uh, you need to somehow do something with that output, of course. And so you should think before you start uh, your event generation, what kind of output format do you want to have? Um, now, there, there are, um, in principle, several different pieces of information that Jetscape stores in the output. So it can store the final state hadrons from the collision. It can store final state partons. Um, and it can also store the full parton shower history. Um, now, to access those, there are kind of two different uh, types of formats you can use. Uh, so one is, is just an ASCII format. So this is essentially a, a custom text format um, uh, that we use in Jetscape. And within this ASCII format, there's actually two different options that you can run. You can um, generate the full parton shower history along with the final state particles. Um, so that, that may be of interest if you really wanted to do some detailed uh, um, theoretical studies or comparisons of how exactly um, jets are fragmenting into the final state particles. Um, but there is also a second uh, simpler option, which is which, you know, makes the output smaller in size and um, the kind of a simpler um, output format to read, which will only write out lists of those final state particles. Um, so I'll show um, examples of both of these. Um, there is alternately a, a, a HEPMC format. So this is um, a standard popular event format um, for Monte Carlo generators in general. Um, and uh, um, this, this has a larger size, um, but it has certain particular benefits um, of this standardization. So for example, this plays nicely um, with the Rivet software that some of you may be familiar with that can really help you um, uh, in your comparisons to experimental data. Um, I want to say a, a few slides kind of getting into a bit more details about how the framework itself works. Um, so um, for the most part, you don't really need to know this in detail. And I certainly won't go into great detail here uh, in the lecture, um, but I do think it's useful to have at least a sense of how is all of this happening when I say these modules are connected, they run, what does that actually mean underneath? Um, and in particular, if, um, if at some point you might want to contribute your own physics module, um, you know, to, to do studies or to really deploy your physics to the community, um, you'll need to understand at least some basics of how this works. Um, so Jetscape itself is what we call a task-based framework written in C++. Um, so by task-based, what we mean is that there, there are these collection of physics modules that I have been talking about. So these, these are listed uh, on the right-hand column of this diagram here. So you see various hadronization, uh, hard process, and so on. Now these modules inherit from a base class, which inherits itself from something called Jetscape task. 
And now what that does, what that task part of it means um, is that there is a framework underlying all of these modules, which automatically will call certain standard functions. So at the start of the event generation, every module's init function will be called automatically. Every event, there will be an exec function that will be called, um, as well as a couple, couple of others. Um, and so that's what we mean by this task-based uh, framework, that, that there is kind of a, a standard interface that um, once you define a module, the framework itself will call functions uh, from that module whenever it appropriately needs them. Um, and with that in mind, um, the framework does one very important thing, which is to define how different types of modules can interact with each other. Um, so this um, is based on the physics considerations. So um, for you know, the jet energy loss module, for example, needs access to the hydrodynamic information of the medium. And so there has to be some way for that information to get transferred. Um, and the way that we've implemented this in Jetscape um, is that the framework itself defines what are the allowed ways for that information transfer to occur. Um, so we kind of try to set it up with a minimal set of assumptions, and this can, of course, be modified as needed if there are some new connections that are needed. Um, but we implement this in what's called a signal slot paradigm. So it basically defines um, in what cases two different modules can interact with each other and defines an interface of how you actually would read uh, the information coming from one module in another module. And just to, to give this a, a bit more diagrammatically, so here I, I show kind of these block diagrams and the left is for the initialization phase of Jetscape and the right is the event by event execution of Jetscape. And so in, in these two different colors here, you see there is some kind of order of initialization that's established. And then you see these, um, uh, these signal slot uh, connections at various places. So they're not everywhere, but they're at some specific places only. You can see, for example, the jet energy loss um, routines down here are connected to the hydrodynamic medium. Uh, you can see, for example, that the initial state uh, provides information both to the hydrodynamic evolution as well as uh, the hard process itself. Um, and so these are this defines the ways that the, the um, these signal slots get created at the at the initialization phase of the event generation. And then during the event uh, generation itself, the modules will be executed in, in order here um, and then repeated uh, every event. Um, one note, uh, especially for those of you most interested in the jet side of the physics, is that in the parton shower or jet energy loss portion, um, there will be uh, kind of for every parton um, um, a uh, um, jet energy loss um, uh, kind of model will be run separately for each of the, the, um, the N initial partons that, that, uh, that initiate the shower. Okay. Sorry, I seem to be experiencing some small lag here. Oh, so James, we have a we have a question if you'd like to take the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that'd be great while well, my screen is catching up. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Yeah, my question is about the, the previous slide about the uh, initialization. I, I don't really understand the, 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 the blue and the red arrows. So you, you're saying that, for example, the initial state gives information to the hydro, uh, but also to the parton, uh, the parton gun, uh, which is then indicated by the red arrows. But there's also a red arrow between the initial state and the hydro. So that implies this is some form of different channel. That, that's right. So, so, um, so, the the red color is is showing um, the connections that will be available, basically every single event. Um, so it means that there is. Um, we want, for example, suppose we have a heavy ion collision, 
it has some initial condition of that collision. That initial condition should define um, kind of the initial state of the hydrodynamic evolution, but it should also give you what is kind of the density profile of hard processes that will occur. Um, so you want that initial state information, you know, if you have like a higher density of the collision at this particular point, um, that should give you a higher density at the, the hydrodynamic evolution. So the hydro modules need to know where that high density is. Um, but the, the hard process also needs to know where that hard, um, where that high density is. And so whatever is in red here, um, that defines where the connections will be available when you go to this event by event generation on the right hand side. And whereas these, these other arrows here that are just kind of going from one uh, module to the other, this is um, showing you kind of the execution order. So every module also will have just some parameters um, that need to be initialized at the, um, at the beginning of the event generation. You need to create the modules, you need to initialize them in an appropriate way. And so those are just showing how that initialization process goes. Whereas the red really shows once they're kind of initialized and we will be running things event by event, what are the allowed um, information transfer points between the modules? That, does that uh, kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, so let me try to move on now. So I want to say a couple words about some of the data structures in Jetscape. Again, not to flood you with details, but uh, to, to give you at least a sense of what goes on here. Um, so the first thing you might wonder is how are particles represented in Jetscape? Um, we have a class called Jetscape Particle Base. Um, this is something that it actually inherits um, from uh, uh, class in the, the FastJet software. Um, and this is really just kind of as simple as possible data structure to store particle information. So um, uh, the particle ID, the mass, four vector, um, as well as possibility to store a label or a status uh, for the particle, which can be helpful. Um, and so here you can have, for example, a hadron or a parton uh, that, that define the specific uh, type of particle that will inherit from this base class. And at some point, if you are creating your own physics module, um, you will, will likely, or you may want to create new particles. And so there are some kind of standard constructors here that you can create a new parton from uh, you know, this basic kind of information that's stored in this particle base class. Um, for those who are most interested in the jet side of the physics, another um, important data structure that you'll wonder how we represent is the parton shower itself. Um, so we model the parton shower as a graph here, where the partons themselves are the, the edges of the graph and the parton splits occur at the vertices in the graph. Um, and so there is a class here, the uh, Jetscape Parton Shower, um, which contains some um, interface that you can um, query the shower and, and um, uh, uh, in principle, um, you know, find the number of partons in the shower, traverse the shower, and so on and so forth. Um, now, all of that said, what really needs to be done if you want to contribute a new physics module to Jetscape? Um, so we, we hope this is really one of the um, benefits or, or main use cases of Jetscape uh, to the theory community, um, that with relative ease, you can take some sort of model of particular physics phase and plug it into Jetscape, um, both so that you can use it, but ideally also that everyone in the community can, can use it and study it. Um, so what do you have to do uh, if, you, if you have some physics that you want to put in and uh, you just need to know how to stitch that into Jetscape? Um, so what you need to do is implement some standard functions. So I mentioned the framework will kind of steer all of the modules according to some standard uh, interface. So you need to implement this standard set of functions. Um, uh, that's step one. And step two is you need to use the appropriate signal slot in, um, interface to interact with other modules. So again, if you are um, a hydrodynamic module, you will need to look at um, this little chart or table that I showed. How do I get information from the initial state of the collision? And then you can call some function according to the, the 
this signal slot that exists, and then you can read that in and take it away with your hydrodynamic code. Um, great way, I mean, easiest way, I think, to really get a concrete sense of this is to look at the existing modules. Um, it should be simple. If, if you are at any point trying to add a module yourself and, and you have some confusion, we're more than happy to help you with the specifics. Um, now, one concrete example of this is suppose that I want to add a jet energy loss module. So we'll actually do this um, in a bit in the hands-on session um, in a very simplified way. Um, so you first, you need to inherit from the appropriate base class. Um, so that will be either like the overall module base class, or if there is kind of um, some modules have a little bit of hierarchy, like in this jet energy loss, um, there is a jet energy loss module you can inherit from. And then here you need to implement standard function called init, and you also need to implement a standard function called do energy loss. Um, this is actually slightly different than most of the other modules here in that we don't implement exec here for to, to tell what event by event simulation to do. Um, but since the jet energy loss occurs per parton rather than per event, um, we call this different function do energy loss. Most of the other modules, you would just replace this with exec. Um, and so you just uh, you know define that function and write in that function what do you want to do with your energy loss? You take in some partons, you will return out some partons from that function. Um, and then all the other pieces of Jetscape uh, should fall exactly into place. Um, now, the last piece you should be aware of if you are implementing uh, your own module in Jetscape is that there is an XML uh, reader to help you configure any module parameters that you want to include. Um, so this I provide mostly for reference here, um, but there is uh, there are basically some functions where if you add in um, new code to to the um, the XML configuration for a new module, um, you can access the parameters listed in the XML file using some standard functions here, where you just kind of tell it the path in that XML file to your parameter and then in your module yourself you can just read in that parameter uh, quite easily without having to do any parsing or anything like that. Um, I should also mention that there are it's possible that you can have parameters that are um, optional. So by default any parameter that you put in um, into the XML it's required that it's present at least in this master XML file but there is um, Another flag you can use in this um, these functions here that allow it to be an optional parameter. Okay, um, so that that brings me to the summary of what I wanted to kind of start with for today. Um, so I hope I gave you some sense that Jetscape really is a, a framework for general purpose heavy ion event generators. Key thing being that it's modular. It's also extensible, meaning that we can add new modules. Um, we're very much um, enthusiastic uh, and eager for more contributions um, and that Jetscape is really meant to be uh, a tool for the community. So we want to enable well-controlled comparisons of different event generator physics um, and allow it to be a test bed for, for both theoretical and experimental um, development. So with that, um, I, I want to next uh, get into the hands-on session um, but let me um, pause here and maybe uh, turn over to the chairs if there are any questions on this, uh, this portion of the, the talk before we get into really coding things up yourself. Okay, so at this point, I don't see any pending questions, but um, we're certainly happy to take questions if, if people have some that um, they would like to ask. Okay, if not, um, let's let's just get going um, with the uh, with the hands-on yep. session. I would suggest.
Okay, um, and Lauren, can you see my slides once more? Yes. Okay, um, perfect. Okay, so here, um, it's, it's okay if you don't have questions in the lecture side, but uh, this side for the hands-on session, we're really going to wrap up to be much more interactive here. Um, and so uh, really the best way to do this is if we were in person and we, we could come around, uh, look at your laptop screens and you know, help you troubleshoot as, as things go on. Um, of course, uh, we're all used to the virtual space now, but I, I really want to emphasize it, it's really key to communicate uh, heavily here in this portion um, because we can't see your faces and your uh, despair or excitement uh, as you're attempting to do all of these steps. Um, so um, I think uh, to, um, to start off, let's try actually getting uh, comfortable with these uh, um, putting feedback into the Slack uh, emojis. So I, I want to start off with um, a question uh, just to uh, check whether everybody has done the, the prep instructions. So you should have seen the software installation um, instructions with a few steps uh, to really get you going and set up for this, this hands-on session. So uh, just to test our, uh, our feedback system, um, can everybody, if, if you've completed the uh, installation instructions that we linked, um, put in a, a yes in the, again, the Slack uh, icon. Um, that's not Slack, the Zoom icon. Um, and if you haven't, uh, you can put in a no in the Zoom icon. Um, so again, please don't do it in the chat, but really just click uh, um, at the bottom of the screen, there should be this reactions uh, panel and there should be a yes check mark or a no X. Um, so I'd like to ask if everybody could put in yes or no, whether you have uh, you managed to successfully complete the, the um, installation uh, prereq instructions that we listed. Um, and if I could ask um, uh, Lauren, if you could let me know or somebody kind of report the results of these polls, I can't really see them when I'm sharing here. Right, sure. So, so right now we have 18 people that said yes and um, uh, there's one no. So if if you're if you're having issues, please um, go to the software installation problems channel of the summer school uh, Slack workspace, and they will help you get the problems resolved. Um, so now we're up to twenty one and one. All right, so yeah, maybe let's let's give another minute. Um, I mean, uh, of course, uh, you know, for, okay, from our so side, we, we, we'll, as we go on, I'll be asking you, you know, have you, did you manage to complete this exercise? Do you need more time? So on and so forth. Right. Um, so we'll only be able to judge that, of course, based on the fraction of you that responds. So please, the more, the better. Um, you can also, there is also a slow down icon that if things are going too fast, um, please uh, uh, try to let us know with that. We'll do our best such that everybody or the vast majority of people can complete all the exercises. Okay, so there's one comment on in chat that um, that the reactions button is not available under Linux. Um, I see. I don't. So I, I don't okay. Know. Yeah, it might. The Zoom interface might be a bit different. Okay. So I think. I yeah. I, and somebody else, I think, has also mentioned. Yeah. So someone I, answered the question, right? I was going to suggest the same, but I wasn't sure. So if you, uh, if you're on Linux, I believe if you, as this, as it says, um, yeah. So I think if you click on the participant list, um, you should see a button appear at the bottom. I think. Right. It and that's the way it used to be. So I think it might also depend on what version of Zoom you're running. If you're running an older version, it would be uh, where James said at the bottom. But I, I think the newer releases. Mm -hmm. 
And it's not, uh, I, if, if you really don't see it at all, you might need to update, but otherwise I, I, I think usually it's somewhere you can find this, this, um, this reaction. Right. Um, so maybe, maybe let's, let's wait for just a minute or two, uh, since it seems a few people might be encountering this, um, uh, since it's really going to be important to get the feedback. Uh, so let's, let's just pause for a moment uh, while everybody can get up to speed. Um, okay. in, in the meantime, Lauren, are, are the, the responses kind of saturating more or less, or are there still more coming in? So we have, we have yeah, we have 26 yes and, and one no. We also have a question. I don't know if you want to take this now while we're pausing. Someone asked how to set the Q hat value for different nuclei at different energies, or is it the same for all? Do you... Um, right, so so that that's a rather specific question. So I, I would say let's let's come right. back to that once we get going with these hands-on exercises. Um, okay. Um, and and really, uh, if if in the meantime, feel free to put that question in Slack. I also want to remind people, right? Like, putting it in the Zoom right. chat is really not the direction we want to go. But if you put it in a Slack, we we will for sure get to it um, at some point. Um, and yeah, if it's if you know this is a question kind of about specific settings, uh, specific scenario, which is a bit um, ahead of where we are now. So let's let's hold off on that right. until we get to it. Okay, right. so so let's yeah. let's go ahead and just, get started. I would say. Sorry, James. Just one. Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, there's a July 19, July 20 framework, and and questions like James was referring to should be put there. Sorry. Okay, you can go That's ahead. Fine. I think we should go ahead. Okay, uh, great, thanks. Um, and then, Lauren, I think I think you can clear those responses. Yeah, I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so hands-on session today. So what are we going to do? Um, I have kind of three parts uh, that we'll get to. Um, the first is really going to be the basics of running Jetscape, um, how to set up a, to generate some events. The second part, um, I want to show an example uh, of how to actually take the Jetscape output and you know plot something with it. There are many ways one can do this, and it's not really kind of uh, there's not like a standard Jetscape way to do it. But I wanted to show you one example to to give an illustration um, and some tool that you could use if you want to. And then finally, in the third part, um, we'll we'll work through an example of how uh, technically to implement or add a custom module yourself. Um, so these will be probably kind of roughly equal time. Um, we have a bit less than two hours uh, going today. Um, so I, I think we should have plenty of time again if you have questions, if you need more time, if something's unclear, um, uh, please just write it in the Slack. Um, if you think it's something that is that is much easier to just discuss in person, feel free to raise your hand. Um, so there is uh, the Slack channel that Lauren mentioned um, that we'll be keeping an eye on. Um, so this this channel here, July nineteenth to twentieth framework. Um, so on the Slack space, um, I encourage everybody to join this. Um, it's likely the case as we go that other people will have the same question that you have. And so um, it's also good if you kind of browse this, if, if you're stuck at some point, um, take a look at the Slack channel here. And if there's a question that you have also that hasn't been answered, um, add thumbs up. So that, that will really communicate to us that, okay, we need, there's a lot of people running into this, like we better deal with that uh, as soon as possible. Um, you might uh, have a separate question that nobody has asked yet, and please do not hesitate at all. Um, uh, you know, there's all of this is new to 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 you, so that's it's, and there are a lot of steps, so it's easy to to overlook something, or or I'm sure my explanations will be missing some piece at some point. Um, and I will have some help in particular from a few um, uh, Jetscape TAs here. So we have Haydar, Matt, and Joe. Um, so you will see them likely bouncing around the Slack, um, uh, trying to trying to be very helpful. And so I, I encourage you also to take advantage of their knowledge. Um, so let's get into it with the part one. Um, okay. Um, so we need first to make sure that we're all set up, comfortable, understanding 
what this Docker tool is and how to run Jetscape in Docker. So um, this, uh, this should, I hope, have been completed during the prep instructions. Um, and I, I want to kind of give a tip also of how I personally run these things when I'm using Docker. Um, usually I would keep two different terminals open on my machine. So one terminal I would keep uh, running inside the Docker container. So inside this kind of partition Jetscape specific software environment. Um, and I keep another terminal next to that, uh, which is outside the Docker container. So that terminal is running, you know, I can run whatever software is on my laptop. And so in general, when you're running a command inside the Docker container, it doesn't know anything about what software you have installed on your own machine. Um, and similarly, if you're running commands on your own machine, your own laptop or normal terminal, it won't know anything about the software that's inside Jetscape. So you always need to um, be aware, which command do I want to execute in which location? And so in general, um, I recommend you do the following. So when you're building or running Jetscape itself, um, this you should always do inside the container. If you don't do it in the container, you'll quickly see error messages. This is probably the most common um, question or error that people get. You know, why did this code uh, give me an error? Um, and the most common answer is, you know, did you run it inside the Docker container or outside? Um, so that's all you always want to double check if you run into some some problem. Like, did I did I run the Jetscape uh, command inside the Docker container or not? Um, but there are other things that that you can um, do outside of the Docker container. Now, this is mainly for convenience. You can, in principle, do everything inside the Docker container. But say you just want to edit a text file, you want to open up your Jetscape configuration, or you want to browse some of the uh, code uh, in Jetscape. You don't need, uh, you know, some Jetscape specific software to do text editing, of course. And so this is probably much nicer, much more convenient to do outside of your containers. You can, there, there are only actually kind of some very limited text editors inside of this Docker container. So if you have you know, your favorite text editor that you usually develop code in, um, you can still use that to open up the Jetscape files. Um, and those will still be saved as the Jetscape files that we use to when you actually execute the event generator. Okay, so what that can look like in practice is kind of here I have my two terminals sitting next to each other. The one on the left is inside the container meant for running Jetscape. Um, the one outside the container is on the right. Um, I mentioned you can edit text files here. Um, if you have installed the root application, which we also asked in the prep instructions, you can run that here. Um, you can do things like uh, manage your Git repository or do Git commands there. Um, so to start, um, I want to check that everybody is kind of set up in this Docker uh, uh, machinery. Um, so if you open a terminal um, inside uh, the container, um, so th this is, you may or may not have Jetscape running yet, but open a terminal that you want to run Jetscape in. And then to start, um, enter this command that's highlighted here at the top, docker container ls-a. And what that should do um, is it should list all of the available um, Docker containers that you have on your system. Okay, so the dash a is going to list all of them, whether they're running or not. Um, so you should, if you have completed the, the, the prerequisite instructions, you should see uh, a printout that contains uh, a container, uh, you know, has some type of ID uh, somewhere. It has a name that we call my Jetscape. Um, it has some version number and so on. So you should see some printout like this. Um, if you use Docker for other things, you may see additional printouts, but you want to make sure that you see one called my Jetscape here. Um, and then if you want to start this container, so it, it may or may not be started depending whether you left your terminal running or not uh, when you did the setup instructions. Um, but let's assume that it's not running immediately and we want to start running this container. So we want to kind of activate this software environment. Um, to do that, then you can run this command docker start dash AI and then the name of the container, which was my Jetscape. 
And so once you run that command, um, you should be inside your uh, Docker container. So you should see your prompt, uh, your bash prompt should change. And you should see something like Jetscape dash user with some complicated ID. Um, you might, depending whether you're using Mac or Linux, you might actually see some kind of funny looking message in the prompt that says, I have no name or something to that effect. Um, that's actually perfectly fine. Um, as long as you, um, you can kind of use this PWD command to see that you're in the right location here, slash home, slash Jetscape user. Um, just depending on whether you're using Mac or Linux, you, you might see some different name to the prompt there, but that, that should be okay. Um, and you can also then ls and just look what directories are there. So there should be a couple of things. You might not see exactly what I have here, but you should see the Jetscape directory, definitely. And you should see this uh, summer school, should be 2021 here. Um, so I like to um, everybody to do this. And then um, if this looks right to you, if you're able to um, start your Docker container and it looks like you're in the right location here, slash home, slash Jetscape user, and you can see that you have the Jetscape uh, directory and the summer school directory here. Um, if you could enter a yes again in the, the Zoom um, reaction or emoji um, to make sure that everybody is kind of good to go in this, this basic setup. Um, so let me give everybody a minute here. Um, again, if you something unclear uh, or doesn't work, please write into the Slack here. That will help guide us how long to wait and, and to give you some help as soon as possible. So let's just pause for a minute while you all get that together. Um, so okay, I see one uh, question on the Slack. I, I'll kind of pipe up for as long as I can see them, but the TAs and others, please feel free to reply there. What if I don't have the Summer School 2021 directory? Um, everything else has gone smoothly. Um, so there is, um, in these, these prep instructions, it should have asked you to also get uh, to download um, a Git repository for a summer school 2021. And you should put it, um, if you follow those kind of uh, to the letter, you should um, have that directory in the same uh, location as this Jetscape directory. Um, and then it should appear there. If you placed it in a different location, but if you don't have it anywhere, if you never downloaded this, you should download the summer school 21, 2021 repository. Um, maybe I can ask one of the TAs to point back to link to that documentation for the prep instructions so that um, you can grab that, that git command. If you did download it, um, but it's just not showing up there, then you want to make sure to move that directory to the same um, location as your uh, Jetscape directory itself. Um, so hopefully that uh, clarified things. I see. Yeah, so there, there are some replies on Slack that should also be helpful to, to clarify that. Um, okay, I see uh, also a question about Docker. Docker uses a lot of space in the slash var location. Is there a way to use a different location? Um, okay, this off the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure about this. Um, yeah, this, this, um, So I guess one, one um, you can um, uh, limit how much. Um, so I, I, I may or may not exactly understand the question. So, so um, when you run Docker, and this will depend a bit on your system, but in the preferences of Docker, you can allocate like how much memory, um, how many CPUs and at least I think on most systems, um, how much space to actually allow Docker to, um, to share. And so it will depend a little bit on the, whether you're using Mac or uh, Linux or Windows. Um, but um, in, in the preferences, you, you can check at least. And I think there is a way that you, you should be able to, to tell how much space you want to allow Docker to, to write. Okay, um, so can I ask uh, um, 
Lauren, how are we doing on the responses? Sure. So, so we, yeses. we have 14 yeses and 15 yeses. And uh, Matthew posted the uh, information on how to, um, or the command to, to clone the summer school 2021. And I'm guessing with the large number of check marks that maybe a lot of people were stuck there, but we were at 21 and now it's down to 17. If, if you put in a yes, um, if you put in a yes, please leave that up until we move on. So it was at 21, now it's at 17. Okay, we're at 20. I don't see any no's, please. Okay, okay I, maybe, maybe. I don't know if they're timed or not. I don't, I didn't, I don't believe so, but maybe they are. Um, yeah, um, maybe we can wait just another minute. So uh, let me also encourage people that like, if you need more time, um, make sure that you put in like a no into the response. And once you get it working, um, you can change that to a yes. Um, because we want to, we really need to, you know, make sure if if you're if you're still scrambling, trying to you know, re-download the Git repository or whatever, um, that we should wait a few more moments uh, before you're caught up. Um, so yeah, let's let's wait just a minute. And again, if you need more time, put in a no to the response. Uh, right. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. If we can see, yeah, if if you're still trying to get things working, please put no. Okay, I, I don't see any no's, James, so I, I think. Okay, uh, great. And how many, just, just for uh, benchmarking, we have similar, like maybe 25 or so yeses? Yeah, um, someone said that they, they thought that the responses were timing out. I, I didn't think that it worked that way, but you know, it's possible. So, mm. um, so okay, it, it might okay, be more wow. than that. Uh, I see, I see. Yeah, I, I thought they would not time out, but maybe that's configured differently here. Um, but but good, yeah. If you notice your response going away, um, yeah, please uh, let us know and try to re-enter it. But that's that sounds good. So let's let's move on now. Okay. Um, so um, right, so yeah, if you could reset the the poll, Lauren. I did. Yes. Yeah. Great. So if your if your response went away, that's because I cleared it. <laughs> Right. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, in case that's unclear. Yeah, we are re resetting the the responses once we're done with the question. Um, okay. So uh, now we are all, I think, set up for this Docker environment, um, and we want to look at how to configure Jetscape. Okay. So I just remind you that Jetscape comes in kind of these two XML files. There's a master XML file and user XML file. So to start, um, I want you to open uh, the master file and take a look at it. So um, from where we were just looking, uh, you can find that uh, location of that file here. So it's in the Jetscape GitHub repository under Jetscape slash config slash Jetscape underscore master.xml. Um, and this, again, you, you can do in a Docker container, but I really recommend, like I personally would do it outside. I can open uh, you know, my favorite text editor as I normally would. And so I just open that file and I apologize, my, it's a little grainy here on this slide. Um, and just, just take a look at it. So you know, here as pasted kind of just the beginning of it, but um, get a sense, you can see how big that file is. You can see, uh, you know, just kind of scroll through and look, you might find the initial state module or hydro module and so on. Um, and that, that should give you some sense that, um, again, here's kind of our database of where all the possible parameter settings are for Jetscape and all the possible modules uh, that you can have. And I really want to emphasize, you know, you're opening this up to look at it now, um, but you really want to use it for reference. You don't want to modify this. Um, it won't technically break anything, but it will make your life uh, much more error prone. Um, if you modify one of these default parameters here, you may forget in the future and you know run Jetscape again, and that would be a difficult bug to track down. 
Um, so this is really just a reference uh, for us to, to understand what are the options, what parameters can I set when I want to set the parameters. Okay, and then um, next in that same directory, go ahead and open uh, what is a user XML file. So this one is called jetscape underscore user underscore pp19.xml. Um, and so this should look like uh, something like the one on the right. Um, and so this, again, you will notice it's a much smaller file. Um, it contains, you know, it's 30 some lines of code instead of some hundreds in the, the master file. Um, and here we will specify what modules we want to run. So in this example here, we have a hard process module. So Pythia comes, so hard scattering generated by Pythia. We have some energy loss uh, module. And so in that energy loss block, there is a module called matter. Um, and finally, we have a hydronization module. Um, so here you notice there's actually no medium. Um, this is uh, maybe not surprising based on the name here that this says PP for proton proton. And so in this way of running Jetscape, we just have a hard scattering, a parton shower, which is what happens in this ELOS uh, block, and then a hadronization. Okay, so this is like a proton proton baseline run here. Um, so open that up and take a look at it. Um, and then you can see uh, what specific things you might want to set. So you can set the number of events here. You can set the output format. You can set um, in Pythia, what is the, the PT hat range? So this is like the Q square of the, the hard process that you will generate. Um, you can set the center of mass energy, the square root S. Um, and then in any specific modules that we look at, you can set um, any parameter that you want to override the default parameter. So here is where you might want to browse the, this master file and see, okay, what parameters are at my disposal? What can I actually set in this module? And then choose uh, if you want to override any of those defaults. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's put these to use and start to generate some events. Okay, so, um, we can, uh, let's go ahead and set the number of events in this user file um, to 200. We can choose a different number, but 200 will run quickly. Um, and then let's also modify a bit what are the output formats that we have. So one thing about Jetscape is you can write multiple output formats. So you can, uh, these, these writer objects that we put here. So for example, Jetscape writer ASCII on will turn on. Uh, the Jetscape writer, Jetscape ASCII writer, which will um, include the part on shower as well as the final state particles. Um, but just so we can see the difference, let's put also um, two additional writers here, which are these Jetscape writer final state hadrons ASCII and final state partons ASCII. Okay, so I, um, in the right hand side, you can, there's like some copy pasteable text that you can put. So, so um, you can modify the number of events and then add to that user file, um, this ASCII writer and these two final state particle writers. Okay. And once you have added those to your configuration, so your configuration should then ultimately look like the one that I have here on the left. I again, apologize for it being a bit grainy, um, but I think you can still see it okay. Um, so you should now have these three writers here, as well as uh, then these three blocks of modules for the hard process, the energy loss or parton shower, and the hadronization. Okay, so once you have that uh, file, that configuration file set up, um, then inside your Docker container, so in your terminal where you're running Docker, um, you can run these commands here. So you just go cd to jetscape slash build directory. And then you can run this command at the bottom here. So run jetscape, and then you just pass to it the path to that configuration file that we just edited. So we just edited this config slash jetscape user pp19, which after your modification should look like the one here, and then run that command. And so you should see uh, uh, as you execute that command, a whole bunch of printouts of how you have set up modules and a bunch of initialization messages, and then it should start generating events. And I think it will tell you every 
100 events that it's generated. It will say, hey, I've generated 100 events. And eventually, well, pretty quickly, <laughs> it should reach 200 events and then stop. Um, so um, let's, uh, let, let's take another poll here um, before taking a look at the output. So um, have you all been able to successfully run this command and did it finish executing? So if you please enter yes in the Zoom, um, uh, if this works successfully for you, if it runs uh, and completes, um, and please enter no if uh, either you get some error message or um, you need more time. So let's, let's give uh, a moment for you all to respond here. So we're James right now we're at three yeses and three no's. Okay, so it sounds like we need a, a few more moments, uh, which is very yeah. understandable. Yeah. Okay. Can you can you uh, let's see, Hadranic. Right. I see. So, so yeah, let, let me again, I see some question coming into the Zoom chat. Please put them into the Slack. That will be much more easy right. to, to keep track of for us. Um, so yeah, if you could just repeat your question in the Slack channel, this July 19th to July 20 framework channel, that would be highly preferred. Um, in in the meantime, I see a question about that this uh, this final state hadron's ASCII does not show up in your PP nineteen XML file. That's exactly right. So what I would like you to do is add that code here. So if you go to this slide, you should be able to just copy say this XML tag here, and then you want to put in a line that will turn on that writer format. Um, so this is this is the, what you have to do in general if you want to add some new things to your XML file to set up Jetscape yourself. Um, so you should, I think, when you just open up the file, it didn't have, um, I think, any of these three writers. I think it had a different. I think it had the HEPMC writer by default. So you really should change these lines uh, to add those writers yourself. Okay, now we're at eight, nine yeses and three no's. So I, I think I think if you're running into some issues, please also take a look at the um, Slack channel because the software install, because some people have been, or sorry, on the framework channel, I think some people have provided some suggestions on what they did to get things to work. Okay, so yeah, let's let's still give um, a couple more minutes um, since this is really kind of our first time running things. So it might take a few moments for people to get up. Mm -hmm. And I see there is some activity uh, quickly going on the Slack. Um, so yeah, please take a look there if you have trouble and write any question that you have.
Okay, so I see um, one question. Um, I think the TAs are answering some of these uh, on Slack, but I do see one uh, which says that the this Jetscape user PP19 XML file, uh, you can find it in your local folder, but not in the container. So this is likely um, due to actually a previous step here. So if I step back for a moment, um, when we first started this uh, Docker container here, right, so we just entered the container and then uh, we, uh, you can do this uh, PWD command to make sure you're at slash home slash Jetscape dash user. Um, <clears throat> and then you LS and there you should see um, the Jetscape directory. And if the Jetscape directory is there, it certainly contains the config directory. And you want to make sure when you um, were following the, the installation instructions um, that there is, so in this big, uh, I think somewhere a little bit farther, actually, I think it was in the last presentation, there is that long uh, line of code to run jet, the run Docker. So when I said it's kind of one line of code to use Docker, you copy paste it some long line that said Docker run and then a bunch of options. So inside those options was um, a command, an option that was dash V and then um, you gave kind of one path colon another path. And what that does is it, it mounts or shares um, a directory location on your machine to the Docker container. Um, and so if you see this Jetscape here inside your Docker container, then I think it, it, uh, you, you for sure should see the config directory. If you go into Jetscape, you should see config there. If you don't see it, um, you may have a problem with how you have uh, shared or mounted um, these directories here. Um, and if you think that's the case, if it doesn't show up for this, for you like this, um, you want to go take a look at those prep instructions and make sure you follow them uh, carefully. You may have changed some directory name in those commands. And so you should just double check until you can really get to see this Jetscape directory in the, uh, inside the container. <clears throat> okay, and are we seeing uh, any more responses uh, trickle in, Lauren? We're, we're at 14 and 2 now. Eighteen and two, so that's promising. Okay, great. Yeah, since they're still coming up, let's let's just take our time here. Um, those of you who have it working already, um, I encourage you browse these configuration files. You can try to tweak some other things in the meantime and just play around. Um, you can also take a look at the um, at the GitHub page. Um, there is linked. Um, you know, more details, for example, the, the Jetscape manual, which really contains a lot more details about the physics um, uh, that you can be simulating in Jetscape. Um, so while we're waiting, you can just kind of familiarize yourself more with that. And yeah, so there, there were, I think, a couple of people at least that had this issue with finding the config file. Um, so if that, um, if what I mentioned or perhaps some other suggestions from the TAs uh, worked, please let us know. If you're still having that problem, that would be good to also tell us. Um, 
that if you do see a Stratscape directory here and you for some reason don't see the config directory, um, please please let us know again so we, we know what to try to help with next. Yeah, but there are also one other thing that possibly comes to mind is there are some different uh, ways that Docker treats permissions, depending on whether you're on Mac or Linux, for example. And so we did put slightly different instructions um, uh, in the Docker prep instructions, whether you're using Mac or Linux. And um, so you might want to double check that you use the right one there. Um, otherwise, the permissions could potentially cause some issue with um, with opening that config file. Okay, I see also a question coming in. How was the run Jetscape executable created? Uh, which is a very good question that I kind of skipped over, but um, and I see it's being answered on the Slack. But once you run the build commands for Jetscape, so running the make, uh, you know, the CMake and then the make command, um, that's where this compilation will happen. So there is this file called run jetscape.cc, which you don't really ever need to look at, but that's like the C++ source file. And when you run these build commands, um, that will generate um, an executable from that um, C++ source file. So then you'll just see run jetscape, um, which, which you can directly execute from the command line. But once you've compiled that once, uh, you shouldn't need to do it again. Okay, and I see some uh, error, some message related to Pythia error in space shower or something stuck in loop. Um, that's okay. Pythia will sometimes uh, uh, complain to you about some things. We don't really want to get into the details of that. But as long as the code is still running, um, that is perfectly fine. You should, of course, you know, from a physics perspective, try to look at your warning messages and make sure they're normal. I think this one is uh, OK, not problematic. But somebody else may know more. And that there is a good point um, raised also here that the, the speed by which you can execute the events may be very different depending on what setup you have. Um, so here, um, you know, I, I asked you to set um, uh, 200 events here. Now, for the vast majority of you, I think that should run pretty quickly. That should run um, you know, in the order of a minute or so. Um, if you notice that that's taking you a long time, like if that takes you 10 minutes to run or you know, something substantially longer than roughly a minute, um, then you might want to modify a little bit and, and generate a smaller number of events just so that we finish things in a, a reasonable time. So the, the number of events you run doesn't really matter. Um, you'll just have a bit lower statistics when we're looking at the results. Um, but the most important thing is that you, you understand how to, how to run the thing. Okay, um, so I, I think, so So how, how Lauren are we looking now in terms of the responses? We're, we're still uh, two people are no, I, if, but, and okay, now we're down to one person is it no. So I think, okay, back up to two. I was gonna say, if, if you're you know, having problems, please click no so we have some idea, but I, I think maybe with just one or two no's we, we can move on and, um, you know, the TAs can help them get them sorted out if you want to move on. Yeah, I think that sounds good. So let's, um, let's, let's go on a little bit more, but uh, let's take, uh, let's build in kind of a break at the end of this part, which will come quite soon. Um, that can hopefully allow everybody to get, to get caught up as well. Um, so, okay. okay. So if, if this worked successfully for you, um, then in that directory that you just ran things, you should find, among other things, a file called test underscore out final state hydrons dot dat. Um, and 
we go ahead and open that file. Um, uh, you can, you should see something like this screenshot that's shown here. Um, so these are the final state hadrons that Jetscape generated. Um, so at the very top of the file, you see some uh, couple of comment lines, um, which are just giving the, the column format. So you'll see all these particle listed with all these numbers. This first line is telling the column format. So um, the index of the particle, the particle ID number, uh, there's a status field, which in this case is not really used for anything. And then um, energy, px, py, pz, um, that, you, that you see in these last four numbers here. Um, there is also um, at this for each event on the second line, you see some event index. Um, there are a couple of other fields that again here are kind of trivial. And then there's a field that tells you the number of hadrons that are in that event. And so following that comment line will be uh, just a list of all your particles. Um, and if you similarly open up the test out final state partons.dat, which you also should have present. Um, you should see something uh, very similar. So that's that's kind of the simplest way that we can get our particles. If we just want to know about the final state hadrons or final state partons, um, these are the outputs that came again from these writer formats when we that we added that said final state hadrons ASCII and final state partons ASCII. Um, but we also added this other writer, just Jetscape writer ASCII. Uh, so if we go if we open the file that was written out in there. Um, so you should also then see a file that's just called test underscore out dot DAT. Um, you can also configure these file names uh, using the XML to be different if you like. Here you will see a bit more complicated file. Um, so this file, it will contain both the, the parton shower history as well as the final state particles. Um, and so the format, uh, um, uh, has a few more uh, kind of blocks or pieces to it. Um, at the first block, uh, you see some overall event information, um, as well as a list of the initial partons from the scattering. Um, and then you will see, so I'm not showing the full file here, but I'm kind of showing the different sections that you will notice. Um, if you go down a little bit more, there will then be um, a section where there's this line that the energy loss shower initiating parton. Okay, so this is telling some information about you know, each parton that is gonna initiate a parton shower. Um, and then finally below that, um, you will see um, the full history of that parton shower. And so here there is this syntax here, um, uh, which has, you see this kind of like zero in brackets, arrow to one in brackets and then some other information. Um, so this is basically telling you that you know, part on zero went to part on one, um, where this index is sitting above of the different part on it's referring to. And then part on one went to part on two, and part on one also went to part on three. So that's like one to two splitting of part on one, one into two different part ons. Um, and you again see um, there were all the relevant kinematic information there. And then finally, at the end, you'll also see a list of the final state hadrons. So this should be the same information as if we just wrote the final state hadrons separately. Um, so this, this type of output format you would need if you want to look in some details of the parton shower history. Um, that is, you care more than just about the final state particles, but you want to know how it generated those partons. Um, if you want that, you can use this, this full ASCII format here. Um, the, the similar information is written um, in the HEPMC output. There is, you, you can get the, the full part on shower history there as well. Okay, um, so, let's, so that, that's actually all I want you to look at for the first part. Um, so we, we uh, set up a configuration file, this um, user configuration file. We added a couple um, different writers to get different type of output formats. And then we just kind of browse the results to make sure we can see, ah, yes, these are our particles. Here's our final state hadrons and, and so on. Um, so uh, let's, um, so how, how can I check, Lauren, how are we doing on the responses? Do we have any updates there? 
So I cleared the responses since we were moving on. Sorry about that. I, I see. So, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, if if people would like to, I guess it would be a good idea to re-enter your response if you're, especially if you're having problems. Should we just do it that way? If you're still having issues, please. Put yeah. So, so what I would propose, I mean, the, the time is ticking, so we can't wait forever. But I would propose we take kind of five minutes now. Um, and everybody can enter your response whether you completed everything in this part one. Um, and if you haven't, uh, yeah, please, please enter a no there. Um, and we'll try to get everybody caught up in the next uh, five minutes. Um, if you have everything done, you know, feel free to take a, a five minutes breather um, or keep playing around or ask other questions. Um, so yeah, please just uh, fill in before you take a break. Um, if you've completed or not the, the exercises. So we're at eight yeses and I don't see any no's right now. I think that's a good sign. 10. Fourteen. So fourteen yeses. I don't see any no's. So James, I guess there's some questions about um, how the Jetscape executables created. I don't know if you want to mention that briefly again. Right, so yeah, so I think I think I mentioned a few words about this um, a bit ago and it was, it was answered in the Slack, but essentially once you, when you compile Jetscape, so running the make uh, command, that's what will, um, it will take this run jetscape.cc file and compile it into a, this run Jetscape executable that you see. Um, okay, so I, I see also a question. What, what is the difference between the ASCII and the HEPMC outputs? Um, so, um, they, they really are, are just different formats. Um, so the, I mean, essentially, whatever format that you decide to write out the information, you will need some way to parse that in order to do something useful with it, to make some plots and whatnot. Um, and so 
HEPMC is a particular uh, convention of doing that. Our ASCII format is uh, a different convention. Um, the ASCII, as you saw, has a couple of different options. So there, there was the ASCII version that is just kind of like the stripped down, most minimal thing you can have, which is just list of the final state particles. Um, the more full ASCII format had all this other intermediate information. So those, those files with the intermediate information will be certainly bigger than the ones that just have the final state particles. Um, and compared to the HEPMC file, the, the information in this kind of full ASCII format is uh, in principle equivalent to what is in the HEPMC output. Um, the sizes are a bit different. I think the HEPMC is a bit bigger because it has slightly different ways of um, uh, um, encoding this information, but I think not dramatically different. You can as well compress these files, which I, I don't really talk about at all, but you can you can certainly, um, if you have big files here, you can get some significant reduction in, in reducing them. Um, but yeah, in, in the end, these are basically just different conventions. So the HEPMC, you will find some other you know, high energy physics um, event generators will use that format. So there are some parsing tools that will, um, like there's even some Python packages, for example, that you can loop through uh, HEPMC events with certain syntax. Um, then you don't really have to dig into all the details of the, the format there. Whereas this ASCII format, that's something that um, you would just need to write some, some simple way to parse all of this output. Um, so we'll, I'll, I'll show you in, in the next section, actually, an example to do this. Um, you can imagine, of course, just kind of reading in these columns in this text file. You, know, you can do it in Python, you can do it in C++, wherever you like. Um, read in those columns and then do um, make some plots or do, do some manipulations of them. Okay, so I think there, there are still maybe a couple of people trying to, that, that don't see the full um, results that we see here. Um, I think we need to move on uh, for sake. We have a little, little more than an hour remaining, but I wanna make sure to get to the other material. Um, so if something didn't work for you here, um, we'll try to get back and, and follow up on, on Slack uh, after this session. Um, I, I hope that we can bring everybody to, to the completion uh, state of this. Um, but for now, let's let's um, go ahead and move on. Okay, thanks, I mean, James. Yeah, if, I'm gonna go ahead and clear responses. Up. Okay, yeah, that, that would be great, thanks. Um, yeah, and if in the meantime, the, the TAs are able, I, I think there are a few more technical issues. A couple of people, I think we're still having a couple of technical issues in getting this going. Um, if you're able to kind of help uh, troubleshoot with them, that would be uh, very helpful. Okay. Okay, so I want to move to the second piece of this, um, where we're going to take that output that we have and try to plot something, try to construct an observable uh, from that output. Okay, and so we, of course, uh, ultimately want to make an observable. And to do this, I, I put an example uh, of how we can do it in the summer school directory that you all downloaded in this, um, in particular in this July 19th framework uh, folder in that summer school 2021 repository. So this again, this is not going to be the only way you can do this. It's really just an illustration. Um, you might find it useful that you can, you know, take what's here and modify it to your liking um, to produce some, some plots of your own later. Um, but essentially what, what we're going to do in this example is um, we're going to generate Jetscape events again, but for um, a little bit more complete set of phase bits. So we're going to take a wider set of, of PT hat bins here. 
um, so wider set of, of a hard process uh, energy scale here. And then um, we're going to take the, the output from those Jetscape events and um, parse them, translate them into a, a root file. Again, you could do this uh, in many different softwares, but since root is something well known, at least uh, to probably all of the experimentalists and at least some of the theorists, we'll, we'll use that for illustration here. OK, so uh, first, I want you to um, open uh, in the Summer School 2020, 2021 repository um, this particular folder here. So inside the July 19th framework section, there is a config directory. And there's something called example.yaml. So this is this is just kind of a simple um, configuration file. Again, this is not kind of core to Jetscape, but something on top of this that we're going to use to, to try to um, help us with the steering and generation of uh, Jetscape events. Um, so you don't need to know. Uh, the full details or understand everything here. A lot of this is also for reference so that you can come back and, and look at it later if you think it would be useful to you. Um, but there are, there are some things here that I, that I point to with the arrows. So there is a list of these PT hat bins, um, as well as another arrow pointing to the XML file location from Jetscape. Um, so what I would like you to do is um, to modify a couple of things. So in this uh, example.yaml file, you can modify this um, list here, which currently when you open it, it should say 100, 150, 200, and set it to a broader list. So here I, I put um, uh, nine different bins of ranging from 10 to 100 of PT hat. Um, so we're going to generate a set of Jetscape events for each combination of um, these, these parameters here, these PT hat ranges that will allow us to get kind of a more physical looking uh, uh, jet spectrum out of it. Um, again, if your system is particularly slow, um, uh, you can adjust the number of events accordingly. I would recommend for kind of average uh, system, probably set the number of events to 500. Um, that's so, so to be clear, in this example.yaml, you want to modify this one place where the arrow points. And then <clears throat> you also, in your PP19 XML file that we have just been editing, you can set the number of events to, I, I would in general recommend 500. You can do it um, a bit less if you uh, think your machine is slow. <clears throat> and also, um, you don't have to, but I would recommend to remove all of the writers except for the final state hadron writer. So we saw now how these different writers work. Now let's just try to go as simple as possible and just keep the one that said final state hadrons ASCII. OK, so let me uh, give you a moment to give that a go, uh, just to edit those files. <clears throat> And then, so once you once you find those and you have those, um, we're going to generate the events. Okay, so this will probably take people a little bit different amount of time, um, but what what we want to do is use those configuration files to launch a whole set of Jetscape events. So this is kind of some machinery that allows you to set uh, to launch a set of PT hat bins. Um, you can use it also to scan over different parameters. Like if, if there is a parameter Q hat in your uh, uh, part on energy loss uh, module, you could run for five different values of the Q hat. This, this framework is all kind of easily adaptable to that kind of thing. Um, so once you have uh, the configuration file set up, um, I'd like you to run these commands that I write here. Um, so first, we're just going to create an environmental variable in Bash to help us uh, uh, keep keep track of things, like I called Jetscape analysis. And then we go to this particular directory location that's listed here. Um, and then there is this kind of big uh, Python script that will run. 
So we're, we're going to be taking advantage of Python to do some of this kind of steering uh, machinery uh, to, to plot things. Um, you don't really need to know anything about Python in order to be able to do this. Um, it's again, just one uh, kind of relatively easy way to do it. So this Python command is going to call a Python script, which itself will just call the Jetscape uh, running scripts that we have been running. Um, and it will pass to it um, the location of this, this example.yaml file. And it will pass also a output directory location. So the output directory location is something, um, again, this will occur in the Docker container. So the path that you should put, I mean, you should put just exactly the one that's here, but it should say slash home slash Jetscape user slash, um, and then here is just a new directory that we'll create. And we'll just call it Jetscape analysis output. And then when you run that um, command, the script will start creating uh, some subdirectories in that output and will start generating events. So you should see some uh, command line output that is uh, looking very similar to the first one from the first part, you know, generating 100 events, 200 events, and so on. Um, and it will just repeat that several times for each of these uh, pt hat values that we were just specifying in this example, <clears throat> example.yaml file. Uh, so, so go ahead and give that a go. And ultimately, um, this will take a few minutes likely to run, um, but you should start to see something uh, like a directory structure shown here. So this was the, this should be a new thing that shows up, this Jetscape analysis output directory. And it should create several different folders, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 8. And in each of those, it should start populating some output. So there, it should copy the configuration files that you used for Jetscape. There should be some log file, which prints out um, some log information from Jetscape. And then you should see this test out final state hadrons.dat. And you should see basically the same set of files in each of the nine output directories that you see here. Um, again, if you didn't remove the other Jetscape writers from the PP19 um, XML file, you might see some additional things or it actually maybe will crash if you don't do that. I don't exactly remember, but um, if it crashes, you should just remove those other writers. Um, and you should see the important thing is that you will find this test out final state hadrons dot that. That will mean you have success if you see that in each of these eight directories here. So let's let's give people a few minutes uh, to to let that run. Um, since we're, we're generating now more events, right? We have nine different copies of the set of events, so it will take a bit longer. Um, and as uh, as you get that completed, so once you see this directory structure created and you see this, um, this test out final state hadrons.dat gets populated in each of the directories, uh, if you could um, add in a yes into the Zoom uh, response. Um, and let's, uh, let's see how that goes for all of you in the next few minutes. Hey, James, could, um, could you go back to the slide or explain again what, what changes should be made to the YAML file? I got a question. Uh, yes, that. All right, so that, that's the one here. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the only thing that you need to change here is um, this list of numbers here that it says like 100, 150, 200. Um, this is just setting the, we, we want to set kind of what range in a scale of GEV here um, of the, the Q squared of the hard process we want to run. Um, and so we want to stitch together kind of a wide range, um, but breaking this up into 
um, several intervals here will allow us to generate sufficient events to actually like populate to high PT the spectrum. So you can just replace that 100 to 150, 200 with this longer list here spanning from 10 to 1000. It doesn't have to be exactly the same. Also, um, you will, you know, you, if you put in five different numbers here, you will see five different directories. If you put, you know, nine, I think like we have, or you will see nine. And how, how are things looking lower end from the responses? We have three yeses and one no. So I think a lot of people, it's mm -hmm. probably still running for them. Five yeses now. Okay, good. Yeah, it will take, uh, take a few minutes um, depending on your speed. So someone asked how to enter comments in the XML file. Um, right, so the comments, uh, let's see if somewhere. I... So he, here, here, for example, um, I see people putting already in the Slack. Um, okay. That you can basically copy the syntax that's shown in this, um, in this example. So like the, the hard process or the ELOS modules, those are, those are comments there. Um, ah, okay, and I see, right, okay, it looks like um, you're trying to put the cur what looks like the correct syntax, but seems to still be getting some error with it. Yeah, so I, okay, I, I'm just glancing at this, um, at the, the Slack message here. So I'm actually not 100% sure. It could be that the XML comment has some issue when you also have other like less than symbols in the same line. I don't exactly remember. Um, so right. you, you that can- That could be. Yeah, I, I, I thought it should be okay, but um, 
yeah, I don't at least see an obvious error in what you're doing, but we can maybe take a closer look later. Yeah, as I think uh, Lauren mentioned in the Slack, you, you can change the on to an off if you want to turn off the writers. Um, you, you can, if, if the code runs, it's also fine. It's, it's only a problem if it crashes here. It won't really make it much slower. Right. I mean, in this case, I think I would just change it from on to off mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather than comment the lines out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in general, I, I thought at least the XML should be able to handle that. But Yeah. Well, it is, it looks like it's, okay, I don't know. So we're at nine yeses and I don't see any no's. 10 yeses. Okay, yeah, let, let's give uh, just a couple more minutes because this um, this is kind of the, I think the slowest part running wise uh, of the exercises. Um, but yeah, we, we want to move on before too long so we can finish up uh, in the next 45 minutes or so. Right. And so, yeah, so to, to be clear for this part, I, I kind of don't expect you to fully understand exactly how these scripts are generating these different uh, directories. Um, that's something you can, if it's working for you and you're done, you can look at in a little more detail. Um, but uh, I mainly just want to have it as a reference for you and to show that um, one can, in a variety of ways, generate Jetscape events with different configurations. And here we're doing different PT hat parameters. Um, and then we're just, within that, we're just running the exact same type of event generation in Jetscape um, using the XML configuration files and producing some particular output format that we want. Um, so in the next step, we're gonna basically take this and uh, parse it a little bit such that we can see what the, the distribution of particles actually looks like. Um, so I, I think uh, let's let's wait just um, two more minutes, and then we'll go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Right now we're at twelve. If anybody else wants to vote, please do so, or update your status. Everyone. To it. Yeah, and again, if you're still running, if you need more time, please also put in the no answer just so we know that um, you know you're trying, and we should wait for you as opposed to um, people just trickling away. I haven't really been seeing more error messages coming into the Slack. Um, so I, I think most things are answered there, um, but please, if you have any new issue or if somehow long ago you had some problem that we seem to have lost, please, you can ping us also with a reminder. We're doing our best to, to answer all of them, but we might miss something here and there.
Okay, I, I see a message that event generation is very slow. You're only about halfway through. So, okay, thank you for that. That's a helpful update. Um, and yeah, that, that's okay. You can just let it keep running and, um, you know, it, it will finish by the time we're, we're uh, ready to do to do the next steps or if it doesn't quite finish uh, you can still follow along and once once it is done run the the next uh, commands and we can we can come back to it as well but if you find say it's it's really really slow like you're much less than halfway through uh, then probably what you want to do is reduce the number of events again um, then some future time when you want to generate higher statistics you can of course do that here we're kind of trying to generate something that will be still small statistics but large enough that we can see something kind of meaningful come out but there's nothing special about the exact number of events uh, that we suggested to use Okay, so I think we should um, start start to go to the next step. So again, if you're finishing running, that's that's okay. Um, so the next step that we want to do once we have this output generated um, is to analyze the events. Um, and so, um, what what we need to do is uh, use some simple parsing machinery to read those output files, and then we need to um, while we're reading those output files, fill some histograms. Um, and so again, I, I provide one example and a small little bare bones framework that one can use to do this, like a simple, very simple jet analysis to take those output hadrons and plot some jet histograms. Um, so there is a, a file here that you can open. And so again, in the summer school 2021 directory at this path that you can copy here. It's called analyze events example.py. Um, and this, uh, this is not a file that I expect you will become a master of and understand in all detail uh, at the moment, but I, I just want you to glance at it to get an illustration of roughly what's going on. Um, it's, it's written in Python. Again, if you don't know Python, that's fine. It's, it's a roughly understandable language, even if you don't know the exact syntax. So you will find in here a um, few functions. So there is a function that um, is initialize user output objects. And what that's doing, uh, that's something called uh, to just create some empty histograms. So that's it's going to create some histograms for the hadrons, and it's going to create some histograms uh, for the jets after we have clustered those hadrons into jets. Um, and those are just empty histograms that we're going to fill once we loop through the particles. Um, then you'll also see some function called analyze event. So this is um, this is a, a function that's going to be run every event, and it's going to basically loop through all those hadrons. Um, there again, the, the full details you don't need to follow, but um, you know you're welcome to look more in detail or just take this as an illustration. Um, it will get the hadrons uh, from the event, um, and then it will fill some histograms for them. And then we also show an example how um, you can do some jet finding uh, from those hadrons. So what we do is, for example, loop through a list of jet radius R, and then run some code. This is this is kind of familiar to those of you who know fast jet. Otherwise, you can just kind of uh, take it as is. This is. Uh, kind of standard code to find jets from a set of particles. And then we're going to fill those jet histograms with the jets that we clustered those hadrons into. Um, and so this, uh, if you are interested in, in um, generating some physics observable, some jet observable, for example, um, uh, according to your specific uh, 
means. Maybe you're measuring something experimentally. Maybe you're just curious to look at some observable or do some detailed study of something. Um, this type of code is something you could look at in more detail and, um, and adapt to your needs uh, to, to get exactly what you want. But here, we're just going to kind of uh, flash it for reference and then look at um, uh, what kind of output that will generate. OK, so um, we had opened before this, this uh, file uh, called example.yaml at the path located here. Um, so you can go ahead and open that file again. And we're going to edit just a couple of other things. Um, so we're going to um, basically all the um, uh, these parameters that the arrows point to, I want to make sure that the, you um, set them appropriately. So there's one that's called n event max. So that you can set to, to be 500 or whatever number of events you had generated um, uh, with Jetscape in the last step. Um, and then there's these two fields that call scale histograms and merge histograms. So these, I think, by default show up as false in that file, but I want you to set them both to true. So that is important to get this to work. Um, and what this will do, these are flags that will basically scale each of these event generations that we just did according to their real physical cross section that you would measure them with. Um, and then it will merge all of those different uh, PD hat pins into a single file with these appropriate weights. So that basically is what's needed to give us a full complete um, jet spectrum or hadron PT spectrum. Okay, and then there's also a list of jet radii. You, I think you don't actually need to modify this. I think it looks like this to begin with. Um, but if you want to you know, analyze some different set of jet radius, you can also add or remove uh, a number there. Okay, so um, again, you should modify those, um, the number and event max, and you should set both of these scale histograms and merge histograms to true. Once you have that together, um, here is then the command that we want to run. Um, so there's a few, few lines here. These should all be executed within the Docker container. Um, so you should first uh, change the directory um, of this Jetscape analysis variable that we set earlier. And then you need to call some initialization script, source init.sh, that basically just gives us um, access to some of these um, fast jet functions in Python that we use in, in the script I showed you. And then finally, you can change directory to Jetscape analysis slash analysis and then copy paste this big long uh, Python command that is shown here. Um, that Python command is calling the script that we looked at, analyze event example. And it's passing to you, um, uh, or you're passing to it, a couple of directory paths. So we pass it this config uh, example.yaml config file. We pass it an input directory. Where can it find those Jetscape events that we just generated? And then you pass it an output directory, which is where do you want to write the new output that, that uh, you know, where to write our histograms to. Um, so you can just copy paste that, that line exactly. Um, and then uh, you should see the script running and doing some things. Um, make sure, again, you run this source init.sh above, uh, or else you will encounter an error message. Um, so let me just hang there for, for a moment as you um, get your copy pasting and terminals all in order. Um, I see a question um, in the Slack, what is PT hat? Um, and right in the PP19 XML file, the PT hat minimum was set to 235. The maximum was set to 1,000. So this is um, the unit here is in GEV. Um, and PT hat is basically setting um, uh, the minimum and maximum of the Q squared of the hard scattering in the, in the hard process that you generate. So this is actually a setting in Pythia um, that, that we just use. And so it allows you, 
um, if you want to generate events at very high jet PT, for example, um, those those have very low cross section normally. So if you if you didn't use this PT hat mode of generating events in Pythia, you would need to run you know many many millions or billions of events in Pythia to to generate reasonable statistics at you know jets of say one TeV. Um, but here we can kind of use this like biased event uh, production where we uh, only want to generate events that have the the Q square of the um, the hard process to be sufficiently high. So then when we generate you know 500 events with a PT hat between 200 and 300 GeV, it means that all 500 of those events will have um, that configuration, even though it's a rare configuration by its cross section, we will get large statistics there. Um, so that, that's a way basically for us to generate the rare event uh, statistics. Um, there's a question, why is the PT hat set like that in the PP19? Uh, it's, um, it's somewhat arbitrary. It's, it can be whatever you want it to be. This will generate you know, a minimum at 235 is fairly high jet PT for heavy ion physics. Right? It's a couple hundred GeV. Um, uh, but that, um, so you could set that to kind of anything that you want, and you would want to adapt it depending what range of kinematics you're actually interested in, in looking at. If you're interested in looking at like low PT physics, then um, you don't need to set something like that. Um, and I see another question, how are the weights of each PT hat been obtained? Um, did it read them from the event generation output file? Uh, that's exactly right. So the, um, the, uh, the, the, the cross sections um, are, are um, also written out by Jetscape in this way. Um, and so, yeah, that um, one has to do a little accounting, you know, where does it get written out? But um, internally, yeah, th those details are there. If you look into the scripts a little more, you will find, um, like if you look into this analysis events example, um, you will find either there or it might be in its parent class, you will find some function like cross-section, which will um, lead you to where it actually finds that, that cross-section information. Um, okay, another question that I see coming in. The Python script uh, says it's analyzing PT hat in various bins. I'm seeing two progress bars for each bin, but they don't always reach 100%. Um, uh, so, okay, it's not exactly clear why it might be happening, but if you don't have, um, if you were, if you put 500 events to analyze in the script and you don't have 500 events, then um, it might not reach 100%. If it keeps running, it should be okay. Um, and so what, what we eventually want to get um, at the end of this, if the code works successfully, um, you should then produce a new file here. Uh, it's called analysis results final dot root R O O T. Um, this is going to be the file that contains our histograms. Um, and so that's, uh, if you see that, then that's good news. That means things worked. Um, if you don't see that, then um, something in the code apparently didn't run. Um, and you should let us know on Slack what type of error message you get. Um, but just yeah, if the progress bar doesn't exactly reach 100%, that in itself is not a cause for worry. Um, rather, just have a look if the code keeps running and if you generate this analysis results.root file. Um, so there, there's a follow up about the, the PT hat min. Is it, um, is the, um, is it a minimum cut value or just randomly chosen? So it's, it's, um, it's a minimum value that you can set to, to whatever you want. The, the specific number of 235 is arbitrary. Um, you, can, you may likely want to change that. And so when, just to, to be absolutely clear, um, back when we were editing this example.yaml file, 
we replaced, um, we, we put in these values like 10, 20, 30, up to a thousand. These are other examples that we, that, um, that one can use. So what, what this code will do is it will basically create uh, a Jetscape configuration file with a PT admin to be 10, and it will generate some events with that. Then it will create another Jetscape configuration file with a PT admin 20 and generate more events like that and so on for, for each of these. Um, so there's nothing kind of particularly special about those numbers. Um, you just want to set them to be in a range that you um, that you want to generate the kinematics for. Okay, um, so I, I think um, uh, let's let's go and try to look at the um, output file that we have here. Um, so to do this, uh, if you have installed this root application, um, which I hope you have from the prep instructions again, um, you can do that from outside the, the container, assuming that you installed this root application. Um, and then you can put in a command that's called root browse, and then type in, here you'll need to substitute whatever is the path to that analysis results uh, final.root file. And if you do that, um, you should, uh, um, so again, make sure you do that outside the container. Um, if you do that, you should see pop up some window looking kind of like this. And there'll be some list of histograms shown um, here. So you should see like your root file showing up in some browser here, and you may need to double click it to see the histograms. And then you can double click on any of those histograms. Here, what I display, I've, I've clicked on a histogram. It's called hjetpt underscore r 0.4 scaled. So note that there is this suffix scaled here. That means we applied some cross-section scalings for these pt hat factors. I also set a log scale on the y-axis. You don't absolutely need to do that, but if you like right-click um, kind of on the on this browser, kind of where my mouse is, you should see some option where you can like check uh, set log y axis. And if you do that, you should see some uh, histogram looking like this. And so this is a jet PT spectrum. Um, so the axes are not labeled here, but the, the x axis is the jet PT in units of GEV, um, and the y axis is the cross section of that process. Um, some of you, depending what version of root you installed, you might get some problem with this root browse command. And so first thing is make sure you're trying to run that in a place where you have root installed, meaning um, you, so in principle, root is installed also inside the container, but uh, you can't immediately get this type of browser information. Um, so you wanna execute that outside the container assuming that you have installed root. Um, if the root browse command specifically doesn't work, there is some alternate two lines here that I wrote. So you can kind of just open the root application, giving it the path of that file, and then type in T browser B, like in this uh, syntax here. Um, that might work for you if it doesn't otherwise. Um, if you don't have root installed outside of the container, you still can, um, I mean, you can open the root file to make sure it exists. So you can basically type this first command here, root, and then the path of your analysis file. Um, but yeah, we're not immediately set up that you can open a browser in the, in the container itself. OK, so let's give um, just a couple minutes uh, as people try to take a look at their root file. And there are a few different histograms here that you can click on and browse. And there's actually two copies of every histogram. There's one is unscaled, so that doesn't contain this kind of proper cross-section weighting uh, for the PT hat uh, kinematics. And then there's a set that has this suffix scaled on it, which is kind of like the physical uh, cross-sections that, that one would measure.
So I, I didn't clear the replies before, so I'll do that now and then you can enter your feedback when you <clears throat> have this step working or if you don't. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. That would be great, yes. So, okay, I see some uh, some questions that um, related to whether this analysis results final that root appears. Um, if if your code finished running and you don't see that appear, you can also check um, inside each of these specific directories. You can look in like the zero directory and see if you have a file that is like analysis results dot root. If you do, then it seems that the, the the root files are at least being generated. Um, I want to remind that um, in this example.yaml file, you need to modify this field called scale histograms and merge histograms. You should set those both to true. Um, if you forgot to set them to true and you left them to false, then you wouldn't see that one final root file that appears, but you should still see um, a root file in each directory, like the zero directory, one directory, two directory, and so on. Um, so, so make sure that you set those to true, and then you can you can rerun the thing. Yeah, and so I think they're. There may be, um, on Windows, maybe a little more complication to get this browser working. Um, there are some comments, discussion in the Slack about that. Um, if you don't uh, absolutely see that, that, uh, that browser opening and seeing the histogram, um, that's also OK. You can uh, get back to it later. Um, as long as this file is being produced, that means your histograms are there. Um, and as long as you install the, the root software that's needed um, and the ability to visualize it um, you can you can also take a look at that later okay so let's give just two more minutes and then uh, we'll need to move on to our last section of the day Okay, and I see a, a question about the, the structure looks a little funny in the output plot that everyone sees. Um, so there's a question on Slack from Omar, um, where there's kind of some hump-like shape around 200 GV. So this, um, uh, I, I would kind of ask, um, do the, do the the histogram that has a scaled suffix on the end and the one that doesn't have a scaled suffix on the end, do they look different or do they look the same? It, it kind of looks to me like this histogram uh, that you show is not scaled but according to the cross section. So it makes me wonder if you maybe forgot to put this scale histograms field to true. Um, because yes, that it, it exactly looks like the, the the PT hat bias is giving some hump like that, and it should go away once you correct for the, the correct uh, scaling. So yeah, so if they look similar to you, that means you, when you run, you should make sure as well to set this scale histograms field to true, um, because the scaled and the not scaled should look very different. Kind of the unscaled should have some hump like structure in it, but the scaled one should uh, look more like this, um, this like power law type of, type of spectrum here. OK, um, so I think we're going to have to move on um, just for sake of time. We'll try to follow up um, more on Slack uh, afterwards for anybody who still has some issues there. Um, but um, uh, so I should also just mention, you, know, you can try to customize these examples uh, if you 
you know, slow down and look a little more carefully. And of course, happy to answer further questions about it. Um, but let's let's move uh, for our last uh, piece of the day, um, which is to implement a custom module in Jetscape. Okay, so in the first part, we kind of saw how to run some Jetscape events. In the second part, we saw how to actually take that and construct an observable from it. Um, and now finally, uh, we want to do something a bit different, which is more on kind of the, the theory side of what if we want to implement our own custom module in Jetscape. Um, so there is a little bit of documentation you'll find floating on the, the GitHub page about this. Um, but there, there are kind of just a couple of steps and I want to go through and have you implement just a very simple um, kind of new jet energy loss module. Um, and so the first step there, uh, I would like you to um, copy an example custom module into the Jetscape source code. So I, I put um, in the summer school repository, a couple of files at this location here. So it's summer school 2021 slash July 19 framework slash my JEL. And then there's like a .h and .c files. Um, so you can just copy with that star there and, and place them into um, your Jetscape source slash jet directory. Um, okay, so this, this CP command you, you should execute from um, uh, basically like your where these directories sit. So where the summer school 2021 directory and Jetscape directory sit. Otherwise you might need to modify those paths a little bit. But the point is, uh, I'd like you to copy those my JEL files into um, this location in the Jetscape code. So let me give you a moment to, to do that. Okay, so um, once you have those files copied, um, we then want to uh, write our own custom module. So go ahead and take a look at um, these files that you just copied. So open up the file that is myjel.h um, and just to, just to take a look at it. So this is a very simple um, uh, C++ header file. Um, all that we essentially need to do is we need to implement our physics in these couple of standard functions that I mentioned to you. So these standard functions that will be called by the framework itself. So in that header file, there is a function declared called init. There is a function called do energy loss. Um, and in particular, those are the ones where, uh, where we want to start. Um, and I just remind you that depending exactly what type of module you want to implement, you might implement exec instead of do energy loss. Um, you know, there, there are detail, further details in the, the manual that I link here. Um, if you encounter again any issue, we're more than happy to, to help. Okay, so that, that's kind of um, what I want you to notice about that header file. We're just declaring those functions that we want to define for our custom module. Um, and then uh, I want you to take a look at the myjel.cc file. Okay, so here is where we actually implement the code that we want. Um, and one step that we have to do is we have to register our model, our module with the framework. So the framework has to in some way be made aware of uh, the code that we have. And in order to make this all work together with the, the XML machinery um, smoothly, um, what you need to do is um, uh, make sure that you um, have the following in your code at kind of the um, 
at kind of the top of this .cc file. Um, there is some line here that says, you know, register the module with the base class. And there is a, a little bit of kind of this line of example code here. Um, and at the very end of it in parentheses is something that is the name, going to be the name of your module. So here I just put in some placeholder. The important thing is that um, it needs, the name of your module needs to start with the words custom module, like here. So you can replace, you know, blah, blah with whatever you want, but you should keep this custom module uh, to be the same. Um, that is necessary in order for the framework to pick up your custom module and for it to know that this is some extra module that it should run. Um, so, you know, take a look at this uh, myjel.cc, make sure there's something in there. You can name it, uh, you know, your favorite uh, name as long as you keep the custom module at the start of it. Okay, and then um, with that, uh, the framework will know that our module exists. And um, once that's done, uh, we just need to rebuild Jetscape. So we need to basically compile our .cc and .h file that we just copied over for this new module. So we need to, of course, build that new C++ code that we added. It should be very quick. So you can just go back to Jetscape slash build, run the CMake space dot dot, and then make. Um, it shouldn't need to recompile all the things of Jetscape and unless you modified things since you last did it should essentially just compile this new myjel uh, C++ file that we added. So go ahead and, and give that a go. Um, uh, I'll give you a moment to, to do that before we do the next step. Yeah, thanks to those of you. I, I see some of you are helping uh, troubleshoot some of the technical issues of others. Uh, that's highly appreciated. Okay, so that, that build uh, should be done pretty quickly. Um, now, now that we have this new module compiled all, and we kind of registered it with the framework, all we have to do is add it now to our user configuration file. So what we can do is we can open up again our Jetscape user pp19.xml. Uh, this is the same one that we had before. And then you can just add in these couple of lines that we that I have circled here. Um, so you can add in uh, this custom module myjel, right? So this is this was basically just the name of um, uh, that that we had um, uh, that we had just put in in the last step, um, and then uh, so you again notice that custom module starting and then some name. Um, there is some other field uh, here listed as name, which you can you know, put whatever you want. Uh, that's just uh, an example of some parameters that we could initialize in our, in our module. Okay, so you just add that module to your configuration, just like you would with any other one. The key thing here is to get the name right. Um, and then we just want to go ahead and run Jetscape again. So inside the Docker container, we just run the same command as before, run Jetscape pointing to our XML configuration that we just added. And then what you want to pay attention to, you want to look a little bit more carefully at the output here. Um, you'll see kind of towards the beginning when Jetscape is initializing, there will be some printouts that um, are saying Jetscape determined task list. And then there will be a list of all the, all the modules that Jetscape is initializing. 
So there's hard process and so on and so forth. What you should look for now, if everything went correctly, you should see a line that says added my custom module, added custom module my JEL to the ELOS list. That means now Jetscape is really running our module. We successfully incorporated it to the framework. Um, and from now on, we can go and add you know, any type of complicated physics that we want into our uh, standard functions there. And Jetscape is running it. So it's taking, uh, has at your fingertips, all the hydro information, all the, it will hydronize all the other stages of uh, the evolution that Jetscape simulates. Um, our new module now has the ability to, to interact with. Okay, so uh, let's give a, a couple of minutes for you to try to verify that. So in the meantime, uh, in case people are kind of catching up, let me maybe just rehash um, what needs to be done. Um, so you need to open up this myjel.cc file and set uh, um, uh, your name appropriately. You can set it to whatever you want, except you need it to start with custom module. So you can say custom module myjel, for example. And after you edit that .cc file, um, you should build Jetscape again. So change directory to the Jetscape build directory and then rerun the cmake and make commands, which should be fairly quick. Uh, then finally, you need to add your, um, uh, your new module, whatever you named it here, um, custom module, myjel, for example. Uh, into your block of modules in your config file. And notice that this has to be inside this ELOS block here since we're adding uh, jet energy loss module. Um, once we add that to our XML, now when we run generate new events with Jetscape, it should get recognized. And so the final step when we execute that run Jetscape and pass to it that user xml file we should look to find that we we see indeed jetscape added this custom module my jel to uh to the elos list so it's running our module so let, let me let's let's just take a couple minutes um if if lauren you could clear out the responses um and once that's done um if everybody could again try to put in a yes if you're able to get this to run and add this custom module to your list. Uh, if not, if you have some trouble, if you need more time, uh, if you can put it in a no, that would be helpful. All right, so there is a question. Um, you need to be in a particular folder when you run um, this copy command, right? So we need to copy these myjel.h and .cc into this location. Um, either, there, there's two ways you can do it. You either should go to a directory where um, this, uh, where you see this summer school 2021 and Jetscape. So if you go there, um, uh, then you can, exactly copy paste that command. You can also just slightly modify these. So, um, you know, you can add a prefix in front of, uh, you know, the summer school 21 to just tell what path um, that directory is located at and similarly for the Jetscape. So basically you just want to copy these two files into um, the Jetscape slash source slash jet directory. Um, and so I just put up here again um, the line that you want to add to the XML file, which someone else was asking. Again, you might need to modify it if you named your, depending what you named your module in the CC file. You should just be consistent there.
And uh, Lauren, do we have um, any yeses coming through? Seven yeses, one no. Okay, good. So I'm glad it's working uh, at least for some people. Um, let's just take another minute or two here for now before we'll wrap up. Um, and again, uh, can, you can feel free to continue working on these um, uh, today and before tomorrow's session. Um, and we'll we'll be offering support on Slack if you're running into any issues. All right, and in case you didn't see uh, Yi's message, please stick around for a few minutes so we can do, after the session wraps up, so we can do the photo if you would, unless you don't want to be in the photo. Okay, so the, there are, I think, one or two maybe outstanding issues in the Slack that we'll need to um, still get to. Um, if the TAs are able to take a look in the meantime, or else we'll take a look later today. Um, but uh, since we're heading towards the end of the session block now, I'd like to just wrap that up. Um, and there's just one last thing uh, for today, um, which is a very... Uh, simple homework exercise, which I'd like to um, have you do for tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow's session will have kind of a one hour block um, meant really as a follow up uh, to today's session. So if there's any issues that didn't get resolved between now and then, um, we'll have a little more time for um, uh, discussion. Um, and the one exercise that I want you to do that we didn't do today is uh, the following slide. Um, so I think it should be fairly straightforward. Um, I'm just going to leave this to you to look at. It's basically to build Jetscape with um, some of the external packages enabled. Um, so you download some of these optional packages, which you should, in principle, have done already in the prep instructions. And then there are some commands down here to rebuild Jetscape, enabling some of those optional packages. Um, so that, that will just help you, um, one, understand how you can how you should build Jetscape to use those optional packages, but also um, is something that can be used later uh, in the school. Okay, um, so that uh, brings us to the end uh, for today. Our time seems to be up. Um, so th thank you all for participating. I hope uh, you got some use out of this and we can continue to um, learn more as the school goes on. Um, and I want to thank a lot also the TAs, um, and, and the organizers, um, as well as, as really all of you for helping each other out. Um, so with that, I, I will close and uh, we'll uh, continue to be in touch and see you tomorrow for the follow-up. Um, so with that, let me pass it back to, to Lauren.